by Uwe Franz from University of uh, Comte in France. So what is the Brownian motion? What is Brownian motion of a number of non commutative manifold? I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to come to Bangalore always. So my first visit to India was almost exactly 20 years ago, and I visited two places. First, I came to Bangalore for a conference that Raja organized, and then after that, I spent some time in Delhi where I met Kalyan Sina and his student, at that time student, Debashish Goswami, and we had some interesting discussions because I had just finished my PhD, and in my PhD, I worked on Levy processes on bialgebras, the theory developed by Michael Schurman. And then they were asking me questions about how to combine this with non-commutative geometry, how to make things more geometric. And I have been very slow to pick up, so it took me, as you will see, at least 10, 15 years more to start working on this. But this is the question that I want to talk about today. So how to, because the first question already is, what is a non-commutative geometry, a uh, non-commutative manifold? by itself, so we have various answers, for example, by Alain Kohn. And then the next question, which interests me more as a quantum probabilist, is what are the nicest stochastic processes I can put on such a non-commutative manifold? So what is the Brownian motion? What information can it give me about the manifold itself? And this was very much stimulated by the discussions I had with Kalyan and with Debashish. And so we tried to present some recent work I did, that I did on this direction. So when you ask a quantum probabilist what is Brownian motion, you can get different answers depending on who you ask. Going back a long time, we have Brownian motions. <coughs> Hudson, Partha, Sarathi, Brownian motion on the symmetric Fox space for which you have a nice stochastic calculus. We can do Fermi, we can do Q-deformed, we can do free, which is Q equal to zero, but which has a theory that, can, that goes much further. We can do monotone independence, we can do many, many things, interacting Fox spaces and so on. Then there's a different way that Maris Jung has been propagating, which he has been, I've seen him talk about many times. I don't know if anything, what is available in writing, what is really published, but with Benoit Collins, his student Stephen F. Sack and other people, they try to start from the Levy characterization of Brownian motion and classical probability. So it's a martingale that has continuous paths such that the square bracket is just equal to t, meaning bt squared minus t is also a martingale. So you look at how you, can you translate these three conditions to quantum probability. The first two we kind of agree. We have a phenomenon algebra with a filtration, and then we know what is a martingale. For the third, the simplest version, which he has often used, is we take Kolmogorov's current characterization of path continuity in terms of moments. Then there's another version. We can also look at the notion of almost uniform continuity, which can be characterized using projections on computer probability. So you can find slides about this, which I found Googling last week when I prepared this talk. I don't know what the final results of this approach are. The one I'm following is quite different. So this goes back to the theory of Levy processes on bialgebras by, by Michael Schurman. Initially started with a paper, Luigi has not yet arrived. Well, so it's a famous paper, Luigi Acardi, Wilhelm von Waldenfels, and Michael Schurman, which started all this. And then after that, Michael Schurman in his habilitation developed the theory of Levy processes on bialgebras. And so I will be working in this setting in my talk here. So the first example was SUQ2. Michael Skeid, who was a PhD student of von Waldenfels, gave a Hunt formula for this quantum group. And it turned out that Brownian motions don't have an interesting theory on this quantum group because there's too few of them. The Brownian motions, following a natural way to define Gaussianity, are just the ones that live on the classical circle inside SUQ2 that is not deformed. So you could just look at a circle. They don't tell you more. Well, then this is, of course, what Kalyan and Debashish did. They looked really at how to combine quantum probability and non commutative geometry. And they have developed a lot of nice ideas published in their monograph with Cambridge University Press in 2007. 
So I remember in particular that they said it's too early to develop a general theory. We should study examples. And so that is what I'm going to do. Find nice examples, which certainly have too many conditions, too, many, too much structure imposed to be a general theory of Brownian motions on non-commutative manifolds. <laughs> but I think they're enlightening anyway. So the one class of examples which I will look at here, which I studied together with Bishop Das, who actually, so he told me to convey his greetings to the audience here. I think a few of you, a couple of you know him. And my PhD student, uh, Shimin Wang, we also looked at some non commutative sp spheres. But with Theo Banika, Debashi studied non commutative spheres, their quantum isometry groups, and introduced Dirac operators on them. And the question was how to define reasonably the eigenvalues. So, so you can you have a natural decomposition from the eigenspaces from the action of the free orthogonal group, for example, if you look at the free sphere. But nobody tells you what values you should give to the eigenvalues on those eigenspaces. But I think this gave some good idea for how to extend things from quantum groups to their homogeneous spaces. And then there's a paper by Bishrop Das with Debashish, where they study Brownian motion on non-commutative manifolds, and some of the examples come from Levy processes on quantum groups. So after this motivation, what I want to do is present results from three papers in which I have been involved, where we look at how to put together ideas from quantum probability and from non-commutative geometry. And when I say quantum probability, basically means I'm looking at Schumann's theory of Levy processes on bi-algebras, but taking by algebras with a richer structure, which are actually coming from compact quantum groups, and so there's a lot more things, antipode, higher measure, and so on, that we can play with. And so the first thing was we looked at compact quantum groups, together with Fabio and Anna, we looked at how to get Dirichlet forms and how to use Dirichlet forms then to construct Dirac operators on those quantum groups. And as a byproduct, we found a classification for so-called central convolution semigroups on the free orthogonal quantum groups, ON plus, and an approach that works more generally as long as we're in the cut situation. Then in a more recent paper with Bishrop and Shimin, we extended this to homogeneous spaces. And then we want to have semigroups on those homogeneous spaces that are invariant under the action of some quantum group. We still stay in the cut situation. We have some uh, condition expectations. And so the idea is you want to have semi-groups that are invariant under the action of some group. And then the theory tells you that you can reduce to a sub-algebra. On quantum groups, you want to have functions which are bi-invariant, which are invariant under the adjoint action. And the advantage of staying in the cut situation is that you have a condition expectation from the big C algebra to the sub-algebra of these by invariant functions in quotation marks because it's non commutative probability. And then it turns out that in our examples, those sub algebras turn out to be commutative and we can use results from classical probability. That is one approach that we use to classify Markov semi groups and Levy processes by reducing to a small algebra by using invariance properties and then ending up with something that is commutative and that is easier to understand. Then more recently, we went back to the Q-deformed setting where this doesn't work. You don't have condition expectations onto these subalgebras of invariant functions. But there we use the original approach of Schumann and Skyde, which I will uh, explain a little bit later, but that uses a lot of cohomology theory. You construct what is called a Schumann triple, and so you have several cohomological questions to solve for that. And unfortunately, in that setting, in general, we don't know yet what Levy processes would be central. So we get a big class of Levy processes. We get a nice Hunt formula. But we don't know inside these processes which are the nice ones that deserve to be called Brownian motions. That's still an open question. So to summarize this, I think one question is, what is a non commutative manifold? And here we take a very different approach from Kohn's theory. We look at compact quantum groups and the homogeneous spaces. And then we try to use the stochastic processes on them to define Dirichlet forms 
Dirac operators, and so on. So we start from probability, and we want to turn them into non-commutative manifolds in the, center, in the sense of con. And the results which you obtained is that we were able to classify the convolution semigroups or their generators, and then one-to-one -one correspondence with the Levy processes for some nice compact quantum groups of cuts type, like the free orthogonal quantum group and the free permutation quantum group, SN+. plus. We were able to do the same for invariant semigroups on some nice homogeneous spaces. So we looked at the, the free, the half-liberated, and also the classical sphere, where, of course, we just recover the rest, classical known results. And by taking the saying that the generator of these semi-groups deserves to be called a La Laplace operator. We could introduce Laplace operators, and we have formulas to compute their spectrum, and, for example, give their spectral dimension to interpret, to start to interpret these algebras as non-commutative non manifolds. We were also able to show that the semi-groups that you get in this way have some alter and hyper-contractivity properties. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. Introduction and motivation we're already done with. I will briefly recall the, some re definitions and ideas from the classical situation. Then I will introduce some non-commutative manifolds, which actually means, for me, I only look at <coughs> those which are <coughs> also compact quantum groups. Then I briefly review some aspects of the theory of Levy processes on these objects. Then I present the first approach, where we classify central or invariant Markov semigroups by using the invariance properties to reduce to subalgebras. And then I will talk about how to classify, in general, when we don't have this approach, using Schumann triples and cohomology theory. And at the end, I present our Hans formula on SUQ2N. And, uh, I think you saw on the last slide, I forgot to point this out on, in the beginning, but this is joint work with a lot of people. And for questions on the last part, you can also ask Martin, who's here and who's a collaborator on that. Okay, so for a classical probabilist, uh, Brownian motion, you can view as a special case of Levy processes, or otherwise Levy processes you can see as general, common generalization of Poisson processes and Brownian motion. So if you want to define what is the Levy process, typically you need a multiplication on the state space. And then you want something that has stationary and invariant increments. And increments are defined by putting them, random variables, together by multiplying them in your state space. It turns out that those are also the, exactly the Markov processes, which are homogeneous in time and space, which means if you translate, well, you translate by the multiplication if you're in a group or semi-group. And then all points should look the same and the process should behave the same from each point and also at all times. And these are very common models used in many applications, finance, etc. So if you go down, Brownian motion is a special case of that where in particular you have continuous paths but then also it should be isotropic. It should run away in all different directions. And so two situations, well, actually the upper is a special case of the lower. If I have a compact, simple, connected Lie group, then I also can characterize them as the Markov processes, well, stationary in time, which have continuous paths and which are bi-invariant or in the invariant under the adjoint action of the group on itself. So you can find, for example, in a book by Ming Liao, there is a Hunt formula describing the generators of Markov processes that are bi-invariant. There's a partial differential operator part, which is unique up to a, a constant if you're on a simple compact Lie group. And then there's a jump part with some invariant measure for the jumps. And if you remove the jump part, you stay with the continuous part. And the, operate, the differential operator you have is exactly the laplace bell ramy operator of this group. And of course, compact simple connected Lie groups are remaining manifolds. So that's a special case of the second, where you just use the metric on a Riemannian manifold. From the metric, you define a Laplace operator. And if you say, you say if that is your, the generator of your semigroup, then you call this a Brownian motion. So the last point would be closer to what Con has done. We should quantize what is the Riemannian manifold and then try to redo this. But 
as I said, this is not my approach that we followed here. We rather take the first one. We generalize the notion of a semi-group to non-commutative probability and then define Levy processes using that. And then try to see if by having additional structure on our bi-algebras, we can still reach this second box also. So a compact quantum group, it's like non curvature geometry. You take some object, you look at the algebras on it, you look at what structure do the functions on a group have, you formalize that, you arrive at the notion of a Hopf algebra, and then you forget about commutativity. So we take some algebra that is a non-commutative analog of the algebra of continuous functions on a compact group, and Voronovich has given us a definition for that. And that leads to the notion of what's called a CQG algebra, which is actually not an algebra of continuous functions because it doesn't, it's not the C star algebra, it's just a dense subalgebra. But that's the object that especially for our calculations we use. So since we are the compactness and the fact that all co-representations are finite dimensional allows to reduce most problems to algebraic problems. So to motivate this, let's look at a particular example. If we have the orthogonal group, then Weil showed that we can characterize the functions on the orthogonal group or this algebra by using some relations. So the, we take the orthogonality relations for the coordinate functions here, and actually we get exactly the algebra of continuous functions on the orthogonal group. If you look at the universal commutative C star algebra with these generators and these relations. And so, well, 10 years after Voronovich's work, Wang used this idea to define the free orthogonal group. So he says we just forget about commutativity and keep everything else. So we want universal C star algebra. Set it, set generated by elements x, j, k, satisfying exactly the same relations, except the commutativity, which I didn't spell out on the previous slide. We forget about this, so this will be a non-commutative algebra. But there are, these relations do imply that there exists a universal C star algebra with these generators. And so we will see that that can be equipped with the structure of a compact quantum group in the sense of Voronovich. So Voronovich defined the compact quantum group as a C star algebra with a map capital delta from A into the tensor product of A with itself, which is the minimal tensor product of C star algebras here, which should be co-associative because this is obtained by dualizing the multiplication of elements in the group. So you turn a function, if you, if you have a classical group, you can turn a function in one variable into a function in two variables by just multiplying the two together before plugging them into your function. <laughs> And that would give exactly a map delta which satisfies these two, two conditions. The co-associativity then would follow from associativity. And to have cancellation, you need this condition. You need the, the close span of elements that you get by taking one tensor of something multiplied with delta of something, take linear combinations of that, should be the full tensor product A tensor A. And so to remind us that this should be like functions on some non-commutative space. We call this the algebra of continuous functions, but now continuous functions in quotation marks because these are not really functions, they, are non they form a non-commutative algebra, but they replace the functions on some quantum space. Initially, I think Voronovich called this pseudo spaces, but it's kind of the idea that Gelfand theory tells us that compact topological spaces are the same as unitless C star algebras. And so one of them said then, general unit C star algebra should be some pseudo or quantum spaces. And so for my example, ON plus, this works. We can define delta on the generators just by this formula motivated by matrix multiplication. And then we can show that the two properties are satisfied. So this is a compact quantum group. And so this will be the first example on which we will study Levy processes here. So what Voronovich showed is that really for misdefin mis misdefinition you can redevelop a lot of the theory of compact groups. Namely, you show that there exists a unique state which replaces the integration against the high measure, which is invariant for this co-product. So you define a convolution 
here between elements of A and functionals on A by taking delta of A and applying H to one side. And this should be invariant. And he showed such a state does exist. Now, one change is that our algebra is non-commutative. And so this, in general, might not be a trace. Classically, we have a state on commutative algebra is always a trace. Here, and so one of which gave an example, which we will see in a moment, on SUQ2, this is not a trace if Q is different from plus or minus 1. Also, it may not be faithful. That's, hap that wha that's what happens on ON plus. The free orthogonal quantum group for n big or equal to 3, which are introduced, H will no longer be faithful. And then we can divide out the null space of H and make it faithful and get a second C-star algebra. That's a phenomenon we are familiar with, with group algebras of discrete groups, for example. You have different C-star algebras that you can associate to them. So I should just say that if it's a trace, then we call this of cuts type. And we get a lot of advantages. Some things, it's closer to the classical case, so a lot of things are easier to do then. So as I said, if the hard state is not faithful, then we can define the reduced C-star algebra by dividing out the null space of the hard state. Then we get a new C-star algebra on which there's, again, a co-product defined, which is, again, co-associative. It satisfies all the properties. But now the hard state is faithful but something else which I didn't introduce, the co-unit, the evaluation at the identity element might not be continuous anymore. And what we work with a lot in this is the subalgebra generated by the coefficients of the co-representations. So this is like the algebra of polynomials in the coordinates on our groups. And this is the advantage then, then the co-product doesn't just go into the topological tensor product of A with itself, but it goes actually into the algebraic tensor product. So delta of a for A in the subalgebra is just a finite sum of A1i tensor A2i. And that simplifies a lot of things. So the fact that the hard state is a trace, which we call cuts tra type, has various characterizations. So it also means that something which I didn't introduce, which is called the co-inverse. So the, on the level of this Hopf algebra, there is something that encodes the operation of mapping a group element to its inverse. In general, on SUQ2, this need not be involutive. So taking twice the inverse doesn't get, get you back to the original element. But on cuts, it does. So this is the other example, which Bonovich introduced in the 80s, SUQ2. So this was important for the general theory, because there was already a theory of operator algebras associated to locally compact quantum groups, uh, okay, locally compact groups, which was the theory of cuts algebras, which had also a nice duality theory. So you can group algebras and functions on groups, which are naturally in a duality. But that didn't include this example, because on this example, the antipode is not involutive. You don't have S squared equal to 1. The hard state is not a trace. And so this clearly demonstrated the need for a more general theory, which Wojnowicz developed in the 80s which, and 90s, which is the theory of compact quantum groups. So this is one example. So for q equal to 0, there's no inverse. It's not a, not a group, but only a semigroup. But for other real q's, it works. For q equal to 1, it's commutative, and it's just really the functions on the classic group SU2. And in general, it is co-amenable, which means the Hartstein is indeed faithful. And so the reduced and universal C star algebra are the same. And one year later, one of which wrote another paper where he introduced the whole family. So the SUN groups all have Q deformations, which can be defined as compact quantum groups using two sets of relations. We have the unitarity relations on the matrix of generators UJK. And we have these twisted determinant conditions, <coughs> which you don't need to look at in detail. <laughs> But from that, you can then derive a lot of other useful relations which you need when you are working with these. And the core product is again defined in the same way, just by dualizing matrix multiplication. So one thing which we will use when we come to the Hunt formula for SUQN is that we still have the inclusions. So SUN minus 1 is naturally a subgroup of SUN. You just add a row and a column with all zeros except a 1 in the lower diagonal. And dualizing this, you can define a homomorphism from the functions 
on SUQN to SUQN minus one. So you just throw away the last row and column of generators. Then that's a homomorphism because it respects the relations. So this corresponds to restricting a function to a subgroup. You just dualize this restriction and you get notion of quantum subgroups. And we will use that to reduce the classification of generators step by step to smaller subgroups. And so on these also the hard state is faithful and actually you see star algebras generated are of type one, so the representation theory is nice. Everything can be decomposed into direct sums, direct integrals of irreducible representations and so on. Okay, so that was the spaces. Now let's look at the probability. So I will not introduce the notion of the Levy processes of Schumann themselves, but he showed, and I will, that such processes are uniquely characterized by the convolution semigroup of their marginal distributions, which are states on the edge we are working with. And so it's enough for us, since looking at compact quantum groups, we look at this Hopf style of Paul G and states on that, which form a convolution semigroup where the convolution is defined in this way from the coproduct. And as T goes to zero, it should go to the co-unit, which is a Dirac mass at the identity element. And if we have such a convolution semigroup, we can define uh, an operator that goes from Paul G to itself by taking the coproduct first and then killing the second leg with a state. And because these are states, this will be a nice family of completely positive. Furthermore, because this is a convolution semigroup, you can easily show that this is a composition semigroup. And furthermore, by construction, they are translation invariant, meaning if you compose TT with a coproduct, it's the same as taking first the coproduct and then TT on the right-hand side. And furthermore, we, we showed that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So translation invariant Markov semigroups on the reduced C-star algebra and one-to-one -one correspondence with convolution semigroups of states on the Hopf-star algebra or the universal C-star algebra. And those, in turn, you restrict to the Hopf algebra and then one-to-one -one correspondence with the Levy processes in the theory developed by Schumann. So if we want to classify Levy processes, we can directly look at convolution semigroups. Convolution semigroups are characterized by their generators. So if you have a, oh, sorry, the T is missing here. So this should be, of course, phi T. But it's what you always do in semigroup theory. You differentiate a T equal to zero. And Schumann showed that that works nicely on bi-algebras because thanks to the, the fundamental theorem of co-algebras, we can always restrict to finite dimension subspace. And then it's clear that the derivative, so continuity, of semigroups implies differentiability. This derivative exists. And if you want to go back, you recover phi t using the exponential series with a convolution product. And he showed that there is a Schoenberg correspondence for the situation, which implies that if these three conditions are satisfied, so the functionals should be normalized that they send the unit of the algebra to zero, they should be Hermitian, and they should be positive on the kernel of the co-unit, then you get a semigroup of states if you pass to the exponentials. And then what we added on the previous slide was that this also corresponds to translation invariant semigroups. So in the work that I want to talk about first, we look at convolution semigroups which are central. So they should, so functional is central if it commutes with the convolution for any other functional. And it turns out that if we are in the cut situation, there are a lot of nice properties because we can just look at dual de dually defined central functions and central functionals are determined by their, uniquely determined by the restriction to the central functions. And you can extend them by using a condition expectation. So there's another typo here. So this should be Paul G, which is defined as the central function, which is defined in this way. This is a function for which Delta of A is symmetric, meaning in the classical situation, F of, so, um, is there any chalk? Yes, so that is exactly spent by the, or classically it would just be F of XY is equal to F 
of yx. So those would be what I call central functions. And they form a nice subalgebra. And so if I want to characterize convolution semigroups of central states, it's enough to look at the subalgebra because the condition fixation then tells me how to extend it to the whole. So that's the observation here that if I want to classify generating functionals on the compact quantum group on Paul G, it's enough to classify them on this. There's too many typos here. This, of course, the second G is too much. It's enough to classify them on that. And then for many examples, we can determine this algebra. So for the free orthogonal quantum groups, it turns out that this is just polynomials on an interval. So we get a commutative algebra, commutative algebra, which is very easy to understand. And so this then tells us that to define the generating functionals, we have something like the formula for subordinators and classical probability. The co-unit corresponds to the evaluation the right boundary point n. So this means our convolution semigroup should start with a Dirac mass in n and then move from there into the interval. And it can do that only in two ways, either following a drift moving inside or jumping to some point inside. And so we get such a formula that describes generating functionals on the subalgebra and using the condition expectation that extends them to the whole algebra and describes all convolution semigroups of central states on ON plus. Then if we do this, we look at the, well, as you said, they're spanned by characters. The characters correspond to Chebyshev polynomials. So it turns out that we can compute the eigenvalues by just acting on these characters. And we get a value. So here I take new equal to 0. So I, have, I, I forget about the integral part. Then I just get these eigenvalues here given by the derivative. And we see those prolinear in S. And from there, we can look at the zeta function for these eigenvalues. Look at the abscissa of convergence to define the spectral dimension. And it turns out that for n equal to 2, this is equal to 3, which is not surprising because O plus 2 is the same as SU minus 1, 2, which can be realized by functions on the classical group with values in 2 by 2 matrices. And so that has dimension 3. But then, unfortunately, once you go beyond that, the dimension is immediately infinity, which is, well, which is something that in non commutative geometry for those happens often when you look at group algebras. But it's maybe more difficult to interpret. But then, since we know the behavior of these eigenvalues, and then we can look at ultra or hyperconductivity, we define LP space is using the Haar state, which is the trace, so that we have a nice theory there. There's an inequality about the operator norm and the L2 norm that Roland Vernieu proved. And using that, we proved that these semigroups are ultra contractive and hyper contractive. And there was a preprint by Brandon Vernieu and Yoon, which came out last month, where they also gave lower bounds, which I think we also knew. I mean, they're the expected ones, but, it, but they also improved the upper bounds, our estimates, for the hyperconductivity times. So you can find that on archive. They also give a conjecture. They say it should just be n over 2 times log p minus 1. So the, And we have some constant here. They have a smaller constant here in front. And they say the constant should be 1. Um, yes, because um, does it? Because one time I want to go from L infinity to LP, and another time I want to. Ah. ah, OK, so maybe it just follows. Mm. Okay. Might be possible. We can look in there. We proved it directly using these inequalities and the knowledge we have about the eigenvalues. 
Five minutes. OK, so it's OK. We can then recall here the definition of the free sphere by Theo Banica. You can look up in the paper with Debashish. So this is universal C star algebra of n generators, which are like a sphere, meaning they're real and their squares add up to one. You have an action of the free orthogonal group on this by dualizing the action that you know from the orthogonal group on the classical sphere. And then you want to have things which are bi-invariant. Uh, sorry, semi-groups on this edge, which are just invariant. So if you act before or after with the free orthogonal group, it's the same. But then you can relate this to a certain sub-algebra of bi-invariant functions on the free orthogonal quantum group. And it's, it's very similar to what we did for ON plus. This time, the functions, the subalgebra corresponds to functions on the interval from minus 1 to 1. So you get such a formula for the eigenvalues. The complicated part is the explicit calculation, because these Qs are certain orthogonal polynomials. And they're the orthogonal polynomials for the distribution of x11 in the Haar state. And that was described by Banika, Collins, and Zin Justin. But they are not known orthogonal polynomials for which you have nice formulas. But working with them and getting concrete formulas is a little bit tedious. But then in the end, you can study their behavior, and you get the dimensions you would have expected. For n equal to 2, the sphere has dimension 2. And for bigger n, it has dimension infinity. OK, so I have five minutes left, which is a little bit less than I was hoping. So after this, I think it's really the non-cuts case, which is more challenging, which poses us more problems. We don't have the conditional expectation. Also, well, so with Martin and Michael Skeider and Anna Kula, we met in Uber Wolfach when five years ago. And we worked on this. And we did achieve, at the end of our research in Paris today, to have a valid strategy of proof to get a Hans formula for the whole family SUQN and also UQN, which is very similar. Two years ago, Martin and Michael found a gap in the proof, which we fixed about one year ago when we met in Besançon. And now we, I think, we're very close to putting the preprint on archive. And this follows the, the same strategy that Michael Sky already did in his PhD thesis in the 90s. But there are some additional problems and also some results which were the nicest generalization that you would expect. It's not true, but things are a little bit more intricate. But so this goes back to what Schumann did. He, he, did, he does a GNS, GNS construction for the generated function on the kernel of the co-unit. And that gives you a co-cycle such that the inner product for, is defined via the generating functional. And so these are two cohomological relations that you have to look at. You first look at representations, then their co-cycles. And such a co-cycle may not, or will in general, not always lead to a generating function. So you have to check. If it does, and so we did this, and there's functions called Gaussian, which play a special role, which would have been our first guess to, for something that deserved to be called Brownian, except that here again, so, so Gaussian you can characterize at the differential operator part in the Hunt formula, means something that vanishes on functions that have an order of 0, 3, or more at the identity element of the group, and that motivates this first definition. So you won't have elements that are in the span of products of three elements from the kernel of the co-unit should be invisible to these generators. And then you find various characterizations of that. And you find in the first step that, again, Gaussian processes on the SUQN are not interesting because SUQN contains an n minus one dimensional torus as a classical undeformed subgroup. And all Gaussian generating functions come from the subgroup. So they don't see the deformation. And then the part that was a lot harder was to, to look at the rest. And from the rest, we slice off parts where the lowest right corner of the, manner of the generator acts in an injective way. And on that, we show that actually any co-boundary for such a representation can be, uh, sorry, any co-cycle for such a representation can be approximated by co-boundaries. And that implies immediately that there is a generating function because we just take the limit of the generating function of those co-boundaries. And so that's where the work goes, to show 
that all these co-cycles can be obtained as a limit of co-boundaries, and then deduce from that that there is a generating functional in which you have to fix a little bit the drift part, the non-uniqueness. And then it turns out you can do this by induction. So we get something that lives on SUN from which you cannot subtract anything more that is on SUN, SUQN minus one. And then you look at the smaller part and again extract one part that really lives on this group plus some rest that lives on the next smaller quantum group. And if you do this induction, you get such a direct sum decomposition, something which really lives on SUQ and then in the way that the generator UNN acts in a uh, minus one acts in an injective way plus something which has the same property on SUQ and minus one plus and so on. And at SUQ2, this ends because SU1 is just a point, it's just a trivial group. Okay, so this implies in particular that if you have a co-cycle that has no Gaussian part, then it has always a generating functional. Okay, so my time is over. I wanted to say that we would like to extend this to other compact quantum groups, especially other Q deformations of simple Lie groups. And among this host of generating functions, we are still looking for the nice ones which deserve to be called a Brownian motion. Okay, thank you and happy birthday. Are there any questions? Motion. Do you get the example of a semi-group which is like a heat semi-group uh, where the semi-group is of trace class and do you have some kind of power series expansions for the trace? Uh, what do you mean by not trace class? Huh? So for the for the free or cuts type quantum groups, yeah, for we, the quantum we looked at the so we say these Markov semigroups. Some analog of compact uh, compact ah. quantum group. Uh, yes, they're, they're you have a formula yeah. for uh, for the trace and the power series expansion for the trace of the same group. Mm. Yes, so we look at the first order of the violet asymptotics. Let's do the coefficients throw some light on the geometry of the quantum quantum manifold. So we don't have a we only have the leading term. So the leading term we interpret as a dimension, but we don't have a we don't have more of the we don't know more of the expansion. Do you think there is the possibility of getting at the General non commutative generalization of the famous formula Hathodi Bordartia. Um, certainly be nice. I, I don't know if it's possible. I think we are not. Hmm? Sir, you started with the non commutative manifold. My question is uh, given the non triple. Hmm? Is there any thinking or idea that may have come out, I may not be familiar with, which has a... So, hope was to get back to these triples. Oh, you do not start from the triple and construct the... But we look at compact quantum groups, or then more recently also at the homogeneous spaces. We construct a semi-group, then in the cut situation, this is nice, we can construct a Dirichlet form from that, then we use the sauvageau cipriani result to get a derivation, and then tensorizing, we get a, something that we are trying to set as a Dirac operator from that. So in the end, from the process, we get a, a Dirac operator, a, a triple, but uh, on the Q-deformed cases, this is more complicated because we don't have traciality. And also, so in the classical literature, there's two approaches to the Dirac operators on QD from quantum groups. There's like the general approach by Tuset and Nishvev and other people, which gives an iso isospectral triple, which has the same eigenvalues as in the classical case. And then you get some where basically the eigenvalues become Q numbers. But it seems that in what we tried to do with Fabio, we get neither of the two. So initially one hope was maybe we recover the ones 
and then we have a heat semigroup and all these things and with positivity but we haven't been able to to fully so on 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 plus I think our triples are interesting and valid but there's not so much work by people from non-commutative geometry on those free quantum groups they're more looking at the Q deformed ones and there we haven't been able to make a connection yet okay thank you